If evidence of the young woman's virginity is not found, then they shall bring the young woman to the entrance of her father's home, and the men of the town shall stone her to death, because she has committed a disgraceful act. So shall you purge the evil from your midst. You should see your eyes. Like, somebody call Jackie. <laughs> Ben's out of control. That's from Deuteronomy. One of those verses we don't preach. And for good reason. There is nothing of God in those words. Just like First Timothy's order for women to be silent will never be from God. There is deep and sometimes violent patriarchy preserved in the Bible, alongside the divine voice, resonantly captured in Mary's song. Then, as now, there are forces seeking to dominate and control women, and forces fighting for liberation. Our question is which we choose to follow. But I'm sharing these painful words this morning because so often we talk about the Magnificat without truly confronting what Mary faced as an unwed teenager, pregnant with a child. Sure, we will talk amorphously about shame or disgrace, discuss how scared Mary must have felt, but we don't truly go all the way to the abject terror experienced at a time and place when too often the consequences were not shame, but death. That terror is the backdrop for what makes Mary's words so absolutely startling. Confronted with a possible stoning, Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices. God has done great things for me. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. And if these are the personal circumstances of Mary's pregnancy, the geopolitical ones are not much better. Judea is subjugated by the Roman Empire. Mary does not come from wealth or riches. Israel is stuck in an incessant cycle of rebellion and suppression, violence and control. She is a vulnerable girl amid a vulnerable people. And yet, in this moment when she might be scared, when she should be terrified, her spirit instead leaps with joy, and she begins to sing. It's the starkness of that contrast which reveals beyond a shadow of a doubt that the joy is not something Mary is getting from the world. It is a divine gift, a blessing from God like the child that she bears within her. She is tethered directly to the Holy One. And venomous words from scripture that were never aligned with God's spirit, words that denigrate and dehumanize. Before the glory of God, those words and the threat behind them have lost their power. It's something that's always fascinated me, the way that some folks are able to embody joy seemingly in rejection of their circumstances. I've recently been paging through the collection of letters that Nelson Mandela wrote from prison while he was jailed for resisting apartheid rule in South Africa, and I am so struck by the resonances between these pages and Mary's song. The letters, for the most part, weren't public proclamations. Like Mary, they were private messages to his family or closest friends. Love at its most vulnerable. I'm going to quote one of his letters to his daughters at some length because I think it gives a picture of the emotions coursing through him during his incarceration. As you listen to the words, hear the pain, but notice the joy that sits beside it. Zinzi says her heart is sore because I'm not at home and wants to know when I will come back. I do not know, my darlings, when I will return. You will remember that in the letter I wrote in 1966, I told you that the white judge said that I should stay in jail for the rest of my life. It may be long before I come back. It may be soon. Nobody knows when it will be. Not even the judge who said that I should be kept here, but I am certain that one day I will be back at home to live in happiness with you all the days of my life. Do not worry about me now. I am happy, well, and full of strength and hope. The only thing I long for is you. But whenever I feel lonely, 
I look at your photo, which is always in front of me. It has a white frame with a black margin. It is a lovely photo. Mandela writes these words in 1969. He's already been jailed for seven years at this point. Would not be freed for another 21 years in 1990, the year that I was born. He was allowed to write one, write and receive one letter every six months while imprisoned on Robben Island. One. And yet, here he is, using his one letter to write about the joy and tenderness he feels when looking at a photo of his daughters. His words rhyme with Mary's. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices. Elsewhere, Mandela writes to his wife, Winnie, remember that hope is a powerful weapon, even when all else is lost. Those of you who were at our first Advent Bible study a couple weeks ago will remember that I shared a quote by Rebecca Solnit from her wonderful book, Hope in the Dark. In it, she writes, hope is not a lottery ticket that you can sit on the sofa clutching, feeling lucky. Hope is an ax that you break down doors with in an emergency. But today I will tell you that hope on its own is not enough because joy is what gives us the power to lift that ax. And that's why I'm talking about the resonance between Mandela and Mary's song because there is another common thread that ties the two together and reveals the secret to how an unwed, vulnerable teen could praise God for the life growing inside of her, for how a political prisoner could conjure joy in a cell without a bathroom. When Mary describes the joy that she has, she isn't talking about herself. She's writing herself into God's story. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly, she sings. God has filled the hungry with all good things and sent the rich away empty. And what's crucial to remember is that in that moment, she is still singing amid the violence and oppression of Roman rule. Mere months later, she will be forced to migrate hundreds of miles while she is pregnant and will be forced to flee Egypt as a refugee just days after the birth of her son. The dreams she sings about have not taken full form. They are still rough, ragged at the edges. And yet there is joy in that singing that becomes an eschatological foretaste of the world as it might be. Similarly, again writing from prison, Mandela observes if calamities had the weight of physical objects, we should long ago have been crushed down with faces full of gloom and utter despair. Still, he does not permit the evil of his circumstances to claim that final word. Yet my entire body throbs with life and is full of expectations, he writes. Each day brings a fresh stock of experiences, new dreams. Surrounded by fear and instability, Mary celebrates because of the radical love she carries within her. In the middle of his pain and heartbreak, Mandela can find joy because he knows that he is in the middle of a new nation being born. And so these words from Mary find us in the middle of our own political crisis, singing in the ashes of a burned down church. There is every reason for us to be fearful or depressed. And yet I look around this room and into the digital family joining us. And I see tenderness and hope and joy and love beaming right back at me. Moving through a fire and a pandemic and a thousand other tragedies that mark this valley of the shadow of death, again and again, this congregation chooses abundant life. Joy to the world precisely because we need it. Joy because the song that burst from Mary's heart and the songs that spring from our own were not planted by this world and damn it, this world will not take them away. To close this sermon, I want to share some words that weren't written by me but by Miranda Cook, one of our youth, 
at the Children's Multicultural Book Fair. She's just up there. <laughs> As one of the crafting activities, we invited the kids to make their own book. This is the one that she wrote. Honestly, I think it testifies to the power of what we are doing here more than anything I can write. This is Middle Church through the lens of our children. Middle is strong. Middle is rich, not in money, but in power and in love. Middle is a place that is safe. Even when it burned, it was strong. No, it did not truly burn because the church itself was still there. It came back. It is a place that is going to rock. Actually, it does rock a lot. <laughs> its music is great, its love is great, but most of all, it is great because it is here, it has, and is fighting for justice. Middle is and will always be here, even if it burns and falls. It will be here. It has black, brown, white, adopted, mixed, and more people. Middle is loving. It is amazing. And it will keep going, filled with love, happiness, and justice. This is who we are. Safe. Fiercely loving, committed to God's justice, not just in the hereafter, but God's reign in our midst. And throughout, fostering the kind of belonging that tells every child, and the rest of us too, you are beautiful, you are worthy, you are sacred, and you are never, ever alone. Joy to the world. Really, right here, right now. Perfect.